Good evening and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jack Ford. Tonight, we begin with an epidemic sweeping the nation, opioid addiction. Last year, almost 232,000 individuals received treatment for a substance abuse disorder in a certified treatment program. That's an average enrollment of about 98,000 people every day. And just months ago, President Donald Trump declared the epidemic a national public health emergency. Award-winning journalist Lori Dew narrates an eye-opening documentary called Reversing the Stigma and has quickly become the face of recovery in New York State after going public with her own nearly two decades long struggle with addiction. Here's a look. Like, I don't think anybody here like was born and was like, I wanna be an addict when I grow up. When I relapsed, it was really hard for me to ask for help because I was scared of being judged. You feel like you're trapped in a sack of flesh that is rotting away around you. People have to stop thinking that addiction is a lesson to learn. It's not a lesson to learn. We're smart people. The next thing was heroin, and then that was kind of the beginning of the end for me at that point. As a community, I think we all need to realize that this is bigger and it is an epidemic. If you wait for your federal government to bail you out and help you, you've been waiting a long time. That's why New York leads and others follow. My name is Lori Dew, and I'm a person in long-term recovery from addiction. There was a time when most of the country thought I had it all. They saw a rising star in the television news industry, the face of three major cable news networks, an award-winning American journalist who could write her own ticket to success. My future was very bright indeed. But in reality, my life wasn't much of a life at all. It was more of an existence. Did you know that 90% of people with a substance use disorder never receive specialty treatment? I was one of them. In my case, it was alcohol and cocaine. And the stigma attached to men and women struggling with addiction was so pervasive, it prevented me from confronting the disease that was destroying my life. So I suffered in silence for nearly 20 years before I faced the truth asked for help, and began the journey of recovery. And on behalf of the more than 23 million Americans currently in long-term recovery, I'm here to tell you that recovery is real. It works, and it's happening every day. But while that is good news, don't kid yourself. The scourge of addiction isn't going anywhere, and in fact has become a public health crisis unlike anything we've ever seen before. This is a New York story, and the Empire State is on to something that speaks to the very core of this life and death issue. And it's simply this, if we truly want to fight addiction, it starts with reversing the stigma. As outlined in the recent first ever Surgeon General's report on alcohol, drugs, and health, addiction is a chronic but treatable disease of the brain. What it's not is some kind of moral failing. The report also points out that genetics plays a major role in determining a person's susceptibility to drug addiction. Addiction is also a progressive disease, typically with alcohol, nicotine, or marijuana acting as a gateway drug. Today, at least 23 million Americans are struggling with the disease of addiction. In New York State alone, nearly 100,000 individuals receive treatment each day. Yet only 10% of those who need treatment are seeking it. So why would 21 million men and women in this country choose to remain untreated and risk dying rather than to face their disease? I have come to the point in my life where I can with power say that I was addicted to cocaine, that I was addicted to smoking crack. Um, and that took a long time to be able to say that because of the shame. At the end of my addiction, it was not social anymore. 
and it became from that every other weekend or you know every couple of weeks thing to that was all I was doing. Like my life had become so small that although I lived in a be big beautiful home, I only lived in the bathroom of that big beautiful home for 16, 18 hours a day in the bathroom of that big beautiful home. So that's how small and lonely my life had become. Unquestionably, one of the answers is stigma. As my TV career kept rising and kept moving in a really positive direction here in New York City, my addiction got worse and worse. On more than one occasion, I found myself unable to actually sit up straight at my desk because I was so deathly hungover. And so I would just lie in the fetal position on the floor of my office, literally under my desk. I think I had this attitude of entitlement, like, well, I work hard, I'm gonna play hard. I deserve to drink and drug the way I want to. The barriers for treatment, it's, it's family, it's children, it's insurance, it's what drug they're using, it's how long they're using. There are many barriers for people going into treatment. They give us three days to detox someone from heroin and don't give us any rehab time. The person actually uh, doesn't really have a chance in hell to get, to get better because three days, if you're using for a few years, really doesn't do anything for the person. Unless you or someone in your family is struggling with a substance use disorder, you've probably never heard of an insurance policy known as Fail First. The Fail First policy requires that the person receiving treatment must fail at an outpatient program before being admitted to an inpatient facility, even if a healthcare provider recommends inpatient treatment. In some cases, the patient must fail multiple outpatient programs before they can receive the level of care the healthcare provider originally recommended. So as a result, far too many of those seeking treatment simply don't get the help they need. And that has disastrous consequences. All too often, the untreated end up in prison or end up dead. Can you imagine if we treated people with diabetes or breast cancer this way? Neither can I. And neither could Governor Andrew Cuomo. In 2014, Fail First became a policy of the past in New York State. And in 2016, New York State adopted historic legislation guaranteeing people 14 days of inpatient treatment if a doctor believes it's medically necessary. If it's medically necessary and a physician states this individual needs this level of treatment, they're gonna go into treatment and the insurance companies will pay because that's the right thing to do. Arlene Gonzalez Sanchez is commissioner of the New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services, one of the largest addiction treatment, prevention and recovery agencies in the country. The CDC says we're in an epidemic here. It's a really serious problem that affects every state. New York is no different. It's an illness that we know affects at least 23 million Americans. It could be a million New Yorkers. We don't know the exact numbers. Why do you think there is still stigma attached to this disease? That's a complicated question to, to answer. I, I really think it's because people don't understand addiction. And, and people, some people don't want to understand addiction. And I think that those that don't want to or don't stigmatize it. But we're, we're turning the corner. You think so? so? Absolutely. If you look at what's going on here in New York State from insurance to deal with coverage for people who need treatment to expanding medication-assisted treatment programs, mm to you know, developing new models of programs to ensure stability you know, for recovery, people in recovery. What we also have done in terms of ensuring long lifetime recovery is that we have developed new initiatives, new programming, non-traditional programming to support people in recovery in their community. We have established recovery community outreach centers mm -hmm. where, you know, it's not a treatment facility. It's a place where people in recovery could come, hang out. It's not treatment, but it's to be with people that 
have gone through, may still be going through, and, and be peers and support each other in recovery. What I have found so helpful in my own recovery is that peer-to-peer -peer support. Knowing that I'm not alone, I don't have to be alone, I shouldn't have to be alone, and that there are hundreds of thousands of like-minded people here in New York State who are going through the same thing I'm going through. It's been almost 10 years now, and every day I get to wake up and be happy, and I have a sense of fulfillment and peace that I never knew before. I have a beautiful family, I have an amazing career, I have so much to live for today. The promises of recovery are real, and they're profound. I was once so broken, I couldn't find the light, I couldn't see anything beyond my addiction. And by getting the help that I needed, I can see so much light now. It's been a journey. It's not like, it's not something that just gets better overnight. And it can be so hard. The journey of recovery can be so hard. But if you can just stay steadfast and you keep putting the next foot in front of you and do the next right thing, the possibilities are endless. Every single thing that I have in my life right now is because I'm sober. It is worth so much more to me than any interview with any head of state I did, with any celebrity I interviewed. All that was really neat, but this means so much more. This is the real stuff. This is the stuff that makes life worth living. And here to tell us more about the documentary and reversing the stigma of addiction is Lori Dew, a good friend from Many, many years. It's always good to see you. Oh, Jack, it's great to see you, too, after all these years. Yes. So let's, let's start off with your story, all right? And then I want to get into the story you're telling now with your life. You've devoted your life to tell that story. So, so tell your story to get people to understand the notion of, of how insidious this can be and how it can affect absolutely anybody. That's a good way to start this interview. Because people look at me and looked at me during my TV career as somebody who seemingly had it all. My own show on the number one cable news network, a beautiful apartment, nice clothes in the closet. I seemed to have it all from the outside, but inside I was dying. And I was keeping a potentially deadly secret, and that was the secret shame of addiction. Uh, addiction to alcohol and to cocaine that nearly took me down. And it was something that didn't happen overnight. It built over a long period of time. So my drinking in college was pretty bad, sort of average college drinking, which is too much. But then my addiction got worse in my 20s. And then I moved to New York when I was 30. And that's when everything took off. And all of a sudden, was, you have this magnificent success yeah. in, in, in a business where you are out there for people to see and admire. Yeah, a lot of success. I was making a lot of money. Nobody was telling me no. And really, I was so deeply unhappy with everything in my life, I didn't want to feel my feelings, which is why I relied upon alcohol and drugs. Was there a, a single moment, or was it a, a, a sort of a collection of emotions where you said to yourself, this is really now a problem for me. I knew for years that it was a problem. I knew for years that I was a very high functioning addict, meaning I would go to work every day and host my show on Fox News or CNN, MSNBC. But getting to work was usually the hardest part. It was getting out of bed, dragging myself to the studio and thinking, how on earth am I going to get through this show. And at, at the end of every show I did, I would say, hey, God, if you get me through this, I'll never do this again. I'll mm -hmm. never get so drunk again. And then, of course, I would celebrate getting through every show by going out and getting wasted again. And it was a vicious cycle that lasted the better part of, you know, 17 or 18 years. But I have enjoyed the freedom from substance abuse for almost 11 years now. And my life is completely different. It is a happy and healthy life that is full of so much promise. And, and that's my message to people who are watching this interview, who may follow me on social media, who may have seen our documentary, Reversing the Stigma. Hey, recovery is a great gift. It is possible. It works. We've just got to continue to get the message out there. 
me talk a little bit about the, the documentary. First, first of all, how did you get involved in this? It's sort of a New York centric look at 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 these this disease, this it addiction. Um, how did you get involved in it? Well, I was so blessed when Governor Cuomo's office uh, called me and said, we see that you're doing some good work out there as an advocate. I have spoken at the White House a couple of times and I had been out there as a national advocate. Um, but the governor's office of alcohol and substance use um, reached out to me and said, we are planning a documentary. Would you be the face and voice of it? And of course, I leapt the chance to be involved in this. And it, it has been the culmination of a year and a half of really hard work. But we think what we're presenting is important because we're not sugarcoating anything. We're telling important stories that need to be told, all in the name of chipping away at the stigma that still very much exists. Let me talk about the, the, the stigma notion of it. And there are a couple of things that are said in the course of this and things that are suggested. And the one I, I think that struck me the most is where people say, you know, folks out there looking at those people who are suffering from addiction say, well, that, that was their, it's a choice that they make. How do you respond? When you're out there now, uh, right, and you're talking to people yep. and they're saying to you, well, you, you made this choice. You know, you're having a nice life and you're doing really well and you're very successful, so you made a choice. Right. You know, so... You made the wrong choice. Uh, oh, but I you, made a lot you, of but, bad choices. But, but they probably say it was a choice. Well, you could have always controlled it. What's the answer to that? That is a misnomer. And I'm so glad you asked about that. I get asked all the time, well, Lori, this is a choice, isn't it? And I think what people fail to understand is that this is a disease that was characterized as such by the American Medical Association in the 1950s, and it needs to be treated as a disease. It's a disease of the mind, body, and spirit. And so rather than shaming us or stigmatizing us, which really doesn't accomplish anything, people need to embrace us. So for instance, let me make a comparison. Do you need... You can get to the point. Do you need to be embracing yourself first before the others can then embrace you? Absolutely, and that's another great point. First of all, raising your hand and asking for help and admitting that you have a problem is the first step, as we know, to any problem, whether you're dealing with addiction or anything else. And knowing that when you ask for help, you're going to receive it. And then, yes, the self-love and the self-acceptance comes with your journey through recovery. I love myself a little bit more every day. I love myself a lot more than I did 11 years ago. People might find that unusual because they say, oh my God, you had the life that we would die for. How could you be loving yourself now more than you did back then? None of that matters anymore. I'm grateful for my TV news career but it didn't define me. Just as my addiction doesn't define me, what I have now is true peace of mind. When I wake up in the morning, I'm excited. I also remember everything I did last night and I wake up feeling great. And I have begun to create a life for myself in the last decade that is full of contentment and serenity. And you know, I'm gonna be launching my own business soon that focuses solely on helping people who are in addiction. So a lot of people might say, but your TV career was so glamorous. I didn't save any lives during my TV career. I'm saving lives now. I'm one of the thousands and thousands of people who are advocating for a better life for people. And that's all I want. I want people to have the joy that I have once I gave up substances. So how then do we get both the, the people on the outside and yeah. them and the ones who are on the inside suffering from this, how do we get both of those groups to, to start to, to shed the stigma? Well, I think it would be helpful if people started looking at this as a human rights issue and a public health issue as opposed to a moral failing or a moral issue. Morality doesn't belong here. This is a public health crisis. And in my so you, opinion- you, 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 A lot of people say you got yourself into this. Sure. On your own. Y yes. That's where the morality part of it comes in? Yes, that's right. And th this is where the shame comes into it. And we know that shame accomplishes absolutely nothing. So sure, did I indulge in behaviors that were not good for me? Yes, I did. I also have a disease. And even though I'm in remission now for 11 years, I'm always going to have it. And for me, it wasn't a choice. First of all, I was born this way. There's a huge genetic component to this disease. And then I was in circumstances that got me to the point where I physically became addicted. 
And we all know when you become addicted to something, and believe me, everyone's addicted to something, and addiction is in every American family. Once you become addicted and you really can't exist without that substance, it's very hard to make a change, but I'm so glad I did. Yeah. Are you starting to see some more positive responses? Yeah. First, let's, let's talk first of, of those who are suffering from this. Yeah. Are you starting to see in your work that you're doing more and more willing, people willing to, to, as you said, put their hand up and say, I've got a serious problem here? Yes. The good news is that there are between 23 and 25 million Americans like me who are in recovery in this country. And those of us who have chosen to go public, like I did about seven years ago, we believe that by, by going public and not being anonymous ourselves, we are helping to create an environment that's free from shame so that we can create a groundswell of support. You know, I think the answer to a lot of this is Main Street USA, is people like me and the thousands of others, uh, well-known recovery advocates who are coming forward and sharing their stories of hope and help and strength. We're making it okay to talk about and believe me, Jack, you know, we're in an enormous opioid epidemic right now, and it's everyone who's becoming addicted, particularly children and young adults in wealthy white families. And unfortunately, it has taken white kids getting addicted to heroin to bring a lot of attention to the issue. Yeah, which is kind of a sad commentary on society. Well, it is. Yeah. But the point I wanted to make earlier was that, you know, people stigmatize us and People who have a dime bag of marijuana get locked up and sent to prison. We cannot incarcerate our way out of this problem. And just think for a minute, do we put smokers in jail because they continue smoking even though we know that cigarettes kill people? Do we lock up diabetics because they are obese and they continue to eat sugar every day? No, we don't. And yet smokers and diabetics cost this country hundreds of billions of dollars a year. So. There is this need, double standard yeah, when it comes to, to addiction. Our, That's why I'm out talking yeah, about I, it. I, I saw we, we mentioned that in, it, it's, the message is so important, getting the message out there. And you had said that in some ways this campaign should borrow from uh, the HIV campaigns, the, the, the uh, breast cancer campaigns. In, in what sense? How do you think that this campaign can learn from them and move forward? And we are trying to learn from those two epidemics. Um, we have a lot to learn from the gay community who came together in the early to mid 1980s and said, it's not okay that our men are dying here of this disease of HIV and AIDS. And so people came together and then you had celebrities come out and say, let's raise money for AIDS. And so once millions and then billions of dollars were raised, now HIV is not a death sentence. It can be part of life and you can survive it. Same with breast cancer. Nobody talked about breast cancer until Betty Ford did. She also happened to talk about her alcoholism. And so by doing both of those things, she took the shame away. But we do have an awful lot to learn from those communities. Last question for you, are you optimistic? Are you seeing progress? I am. I see it every day in my community of Atlanta where I live. I see it here in New York City. I see it all around the country in my travels when I speak to groups. My main concern right now is making sure that President Trump actually ends up doing something. Because since announcing the public health emergency at the end of October, not only has no funding been released, the president has not even requested funding. And so nothing can really be done on the national level until we receive the funding that we need to. And as the lieutenant governor of New York said in the documentary, if we rely on the federal government, we'll get nowhere. So it would be great to see some leadership from Washington, but I do think that a lot of the support is gonna have to come from Main Street USA and corporations and people who want to uh, privately donate to this cause. More money needs to be raised because millions and millions of people need help out there. I have to realize it's a war that we cannot afford to lose. This is a war. And simply calling it a war on drugs has not worked at all. Just say no has not worked. Um, what we need really is to talk openly and raise more money and really get out there to let everybody know that it's not a moral issue. This is a public health crisis and it isn't going anywhere. So we've got to band together 
to deal with this just as we have with other diseases. Well, it, it's marvelous work you're doing. I, I am so glad to know that you are happy and well. Oh, I am very happy, and I'm Good. really happy to be here with you Good. today, my friend. It's our pleasure. Lori, you be well. We'll talk again soon.